Chris? Yes. Hey, man. Thanks for bearing with <laughs> hey. me. That's all right. No worries. How are you? What's going on? Oh, just um, just relaxing, just home from uh, home from work, and sitting down with a with a drink, and you know, living Ready the dream. Ready to man. settle in and go over <laughs> some old memories. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, well, absolutely. I I read that um, that the band itself that you guys rarely ever did any interviews. And because of that, there's actually, like, not a lot of information out there uh, about yes. about, about <laughs> yes. the band. So <laughs> I appreciate you uh, you doing an interview with me. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, that, yeah, my, my pleasure. I, I think any of the guys probably would have been happy to. I just, um, you know, back, back then, I think we, we, we were very much inspired by, by bands who didn't talk too much, you know, so we sort of took the approach that maybe less talking and, and more music made, made more sense. And I think maybe ultimately we probably could have shared a little bit more about what we were all about and what we were trying to accomplish. But, um, you know, at the time, that's not the direction we uh, we opted for. So, that's the way it goes. You, you could have recorded some more music too. Well, we recorded a lot of music, actually. I mean, we we were pretty much constantly recording. Um, the guys, um, all the guys in the band, were really really talented uh, home engineer and semi pro engineers. Like we had. <clears throat> reel to reels, we had four tracks, we had cassettes, we recorded almost everything we did. So when the band broke up we probably had about thirty songs, I mean, you know, twenty songs maybe that we uh that we hadn't ever released but we'd recorded that we uh, gave out to friends just uh because we, we wanted them to hear them. But we recorded a lot, we just didn't uh put out a lot of records. So so still to this day you guys never put that, that stuff out? Well, we um we did several singles. So before um so before we moved to Boston, we we released a single when we were in Virginia and then um we released another single once we were in Boston. And then after that, we self-released um a full length. And um we subsequently released a few splits and appeared on a few compilations, but we were constantly recording. So when we had um when we had signed uh, ultimately signed our, our record deal, the the deal was for more than one record. So we self released the ones or we, we re released the one that we'd self released and then we were working on our second one when we when we broke up. So pretty much all the songs that would have been on that second record we we just had demoed and gave out gave out to friends when when it was clear we weren't gonna put out another record on on the label. Yeah, so they're around. They're float. They're floating around. People, people yeah. them. Um, but they just didn't get put on to a proper release, really. Well, so going going all the way back then, because we're now kind of like starting at the end. <laughs> yeah. About the the breakup of the band. Um, are you uh, are you from Northern Virginia originally? Yep. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I um I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia. So, you know, a few minutes outside of Washington DC and um you know, at the time uh when I was a kid in the in the eighties, um, it was you know, just massive suburbs, you know, BMX riding and skateboarding and music and just um, you know, suburban suburban uh, suburban Virginia. Um but it's funny and you know, looking back on it a lot of a lot of musicians sort of were born out of that that time, um, and all the guys were from all the guys in Gilbert were from that area as well. Um, I was slightly slightly older than the rest of the guys, but not by much, maybe by a couple of years. So you said that there were a lot of musicians coming from that area. What do you think it was that you know got all these people at that time to to turn to music? As they're out I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it was any different than any other suburban 
part of the country, but I think at least for, for me, um, there there wasn't a whole lot to, there wasn't a whole lot to do. I mean, like I said, you know, skateboarding and 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 BMX racing and stuff, but um, you know, we all had houses, so we all had sort of big bedrooms, and you know, we could take music classes in school, and so I think at least for me, um, it seemed just kind of one of those things that, you know, my parents were really cool about making sure that I had any instrument that I wanted. Um, but, you know, as a, as a teenager, I certainly started to become aware of the music that was coming out of D.C., which was really exciting. So you're talking about um, D.C. punk bands that were super exciting. And as teenagers, like, it was a pretty short trip into the city to see music. So... I don't know, as a teenager, I think it was a pretty interesting place to be because the, the music scene in D.C. was so compelling. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Bad Brains and Minor Threat and then subsequently Fugazi and, you know, all these incredible, I mean, to me, incredible bands that were hugely inspiring and, you know, Vehicle Birth ripped off all of them. Now, it's everybody else who were incredible, too. <laughs> was that... I said to all of us, they were incredible too. You are in a yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make assumptions for other people's taste, but you know, at least my circle of friends, like those were the bands that, you know, we were listening to Clash and Sex Pistols and and, and you know, English punk. But then, you know, when we found, at least when I found out that there was punk in my backyard, I was like, oh my god, you know. So I was kind of a late bloomer to it. I sort of relied on my friends to to, to show me those records. Um. And, I mean, I'm really glad they did because it was life-changing, you know, as a teenager. Um, Did you go see a lot of shows from those bands? Yeah. Well, well, ironically, it wasn't until I'd gone away and come back as a teenager that I started to actually go into the city and see the the bands, um, Fugazi and, and those those seminal bands I was just talking about. I mean, I was sort of raised as a pop kid. I was listening to, to, to pop music, and I was huge into, like, I would just listen to the radio constantly, so listen to all the top 40 hits, and my parents had the, um, got me that Time Life record subscription, so I would get, you know, like, Beach Boys and the Commodores and all these old records I listened to. So I was constantly devouring music, so... I didn't really go out much until I was a, a late teenager. And then when I started to hear about the clubs, like 930 Club, and I would go out and and, um, and see shows. But it wasn't until I was like 18, 17, 18 that I started doing that. What was the best of all of those shows? Like I mean, what stands out in your mind? I think, I think it's just... Um, I think that's a tricky one because, you know, as a as a kid, pretty much for me, just being completely obsessed with stuff that I heard on the radio and wanting to be on the radio, when I started to see bands and small clubs that I heard on the radio, that was really, that was really something. So, you know, seeing Radiohead at the 930 Club, at the old 930 Club on their first U.S. tour was crazy for me because they they could have been a, a punk band from England and I wouldn't have known about it I mean it was just I heard them on the radio I liked a song and then here I am packed in here with you know 200 sweaty people and I don't know how I'm, I'm going to get home I don't know if my car is going to be there when I get back like those kinds of early <laughs> teenage experiences were like this is really dangerous and hindsight wasn't dangerous at all but as for, for me a kid from the suburbs it was like okay this this is where it's at. Oh, my hand, protect me. 
And then, of course, every every Fugazi show I saw was like going to church. So, you know, I probably saw them more up in the Boston area as a kid in, you know, in my early 20s than I did in D.C. Um, but in terms of D.C. shows, I mean, it would be shows that the clubs aren't around anymore, you know, seeing, seeing bands at the 930 Club. Um, and then... You know, shows at the Black Hat. But I, I, you know, I regret not sneaking into the city more as a super young kid and seeing Minor Threat and Bad Brains, which my friends were doing. It was a little bit before my time, and maybe my confidence wasn't. <laughs> it's, I wasn't going to be sneaking out of my house at like 13 to go see those bands. So. You said going away. You mean when you went to Boston, or did you go away? From yeah, Boston? yeah. We well, I mean, we keep working. Keep going backwards, but yeah, the I moved from Virginia when I was twenty, and the guys in the band were like we were like eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So then we 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 were in Boston, and Fugazi was really active. So they were touring quite a bit, like every every couple times every year for years. So we we would see them, we would go together, and we would see them in Rhode Island, we'd see them in Massachusetts, we'd see them. In D.C., we'd see them at Fort Reno, which is, well, you know, Fort Reno in the park. We'd see them in the park. Um, so kind of wherever we were between the years of, like, 93 and whenever they stopped playing, we were we were there. As long as they were on the East Coast, pretty much we were there. Um, was guitar your first instrument? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was uh I was 4 when I when I was, I was in like uh nursery school and and I had just gotten up from a, a nap, you know, they put you on the mats and make you take a nap and then have a snack. And they sat us all in um this auditorium and I saw this guy come on stage with an acoustic guitar and he um started playing songs. And I was like, "Oh my god, I want to I want I I, I want to do that." So I went home and told my mom and um they got me a guitar. And that was 4. And um, I was terrible, but I I got lessons and I kind of learned a few things and and um, yeah, I mean I, I kept it up until I was ten or eleven, and then I started playing saxophone, and then I went back to, to the guitar and um, but yeah, but guitar was the first and, and really the only one I'm somewhat proficient at. Did you take guitar in school? Or it was I took private. I took lessons. I took lessons at a um, at a music store in a strip mall in in Northern Virginia. So they didn't have it in school. I mean, they the kids we played. I think recorders when we were maybe in fourth grade. But I was playing guitar um, in kindergarten, and so I would have to go to a um, like a you know a music store where they got lessons in the back, kind of thing with a you know old dude who smells like Marlboro Reds and, you know, teaching you scales and stuff. So it was pretty miserable because I didn't want to learn scales. I wanted to learn how to play songs like, you know, songs, you know. So it was tricky to take lessons as a as a kid. Um, what What's the first song that you, um, you know, that you wanted to play that you weren't, like, given by a guitar teacher to learn that you wanted to play that you mastered? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, I wanted to play Peter Gunn, the James Bond theme song. You know, bow, bow, ding, 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 that thing. I wanted to play that. Um, and I, I wanted to play, uh, 
LaGrange. Is that the James Bond theme song? It's the Spy Hunter theme song. I always, it's, is it Spy Hunter? <laughs> So I wanted to play that, whatever yeah, that was, the video Peter game. Gunn, and yeah. I wanted to play uh, LaGrange by ZZ Top. Nice. <laughs> Rumor spreading round, United takes in town, by the shack outside LaGrange. You know what I'm talking about. Just let me know if you're going to go to that whole mile on the range. They got a lot of nice girls. Huh? I'm racing. And uh, I learned those, and I got a lot of mileage out of out of those for a while. And um, and then it was a Day Tripper, the Beatles Day Tripper, um, which was a pretty sweet lick on the E and A strings, pretty easy. But um, yeah, just riffs, man. I just wanted to play riffs, um, riffs and hooks. I didn't really care too much about solos and stuff like that. I just sort of wanted to play the hooks. Um, Were you coming up with your own riffs too? No, I, I'd like to say yeah, but no, I, I, I really struggled. I mean, I, I was having, you know, guitar teacher was trying to teach me how to play scales and to hold, you know, hold my fingers right on the strings, and I just didn't have the, the patience or the interest for that because the scale didn't sound like a song or anything. It wasn't cool. I don't know if I had an idea of what was cool when I was that age. I think it was just like, well, that doesn't sound like anything. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't sound like any. Uh, music you, um, you knew peter gunn was cool yeah that's true i mean that's the thing i mean i knew the i knew i knew like things that were riffs that i could hum so i i wanted to play things that i could kind of remember so i think those things that i could remember i wanted to play so lagrange is you know three notes that peter gunn's like you know four notes the stuff that i could kind of remember that's what i wanted to be able to play Anything more complex than that, I couldn't really wrap my head around. It wasn't until much, much later that I could actually do more than just sort of like play three or four notes over and over and over again. Now, do you remember other people being around, like playing in bands and like being aware that other people, you know, once you got a little bit older around you were, were forming bands or playing in bands? Well, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know anyone who played an instrument from as early as I did, and I, I wasn't even very good. But my, you know, I would bring the guitar into school once a year and play my little riff around the classroom, and everyone would clap and be totally enthralled. And I did that from probably first grade to fifth or sixth grade, and it wasn't until maybe seventh grade. So what's that? Well, twelve, eleven or twelve that um you know other other people were playing instruments like when i got to junior high the middle middle school rather like okay other people are playing instruments and they're actually pretty good and they i remember one one of my classmates wanted me to make a band with him and he made me audition in his house and like, <laughs> he wanted me to play uh uh songs off the of van halen 1984 <laughs> record and I was like, dude, you can't play songs off this record. How 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 am I supposed to play these songs? So it was really weird. I think we we wanted to be in bands, but we weren't nearly good enough to actually pull it off. So I remember one time I had my mom make me uh, trucker hats with a, a band name on it, and I gave them out to the coolest dudes in my uh, my class. We could have a band, but we had a band name, but no band. Because <laughs> um, if we wanted to be in bands, we didn't really know how to do it. So. Putting the cart before the horse, big time. Oh yeah, there, but, always, always. But yeah. you know, you were way ahead on the whole branding thing. Yes, yeah. Got that, got that wrong in my professional bands, but got that very right in my non-existent childhood bands. <laughs> so when, when were you actually able to put together your first real band? Um. So I think I went back to guitar in high school, and um, 
<clears throat> then it was pretty it was pretty much like off and running from there. So I, I pretty much um yeah, I mean I got asked to play guitar with uh some guys that were a lot older than me, like college guys. Wanted for me to play guitar, so I was playing in cover bands, uh, in bars in, in Washington D C when I was like sixteen, seventeen. I want to say, 17. Um, and then I started my own band with one of my one of my best friends, and, and then that's, you know, when I was about 17. And we started writing, like, real songs and went to a recording studio for the first time, and maybe I was 18 then. Um, we played shows, you know, locally, colleges, and um, so probably, you know, 17, 18, that was, like, all right, serious business. What was that band called? That one was called Nadine. Um, Nadine. And it was um, probably, you know, 80% 80 covers and 20% original stuff. So we'd sprinkle in the odd original. Um, And it was the kind of thing, you know, we'd get paid to play two-hour sets at frat parties or, um, you know, two two hour long sets in a bar and we'd get like fifty bucks or something. So it was pretty much a cover band but sneaking in the the originals. Like singer was sort of like a Bob Dylan ish type dude and and uh our our other guitar player was a metal guy, one of my one of my best friends. And uh I was, you know, essentially this mullet and trying to play everything from C C R to Smashing Pumpkins. We were all over the place. Um, drummer's still a close friend. He's an airline pilot now, but he was, you know, he had the, the Gibraltar drum set. This thing looked like scaffolding. You know, I'm sure you've seen them with like <laughs> chrome. It's, you could barely, he could barely see over the top of it. This monstrosity of a drum kit. I mean, we were ridiculous. Must have um, been really fun to tour with that. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, it was all like station wagon shows or minivan shows, you know, shows. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> All of our gear was much nicer than our talent level, so it was crazy, like guitar what, center stuff. Where did you guys record? Um, we recorded in a studio in um Oh man, it was in Vir- it was in Burke, I think. Burke, Virginia. I can't remember where it was exactly. It was one of those, you know, you pay a flat rate and you bang out a song and you get a tape at the end of the day kind of thing. It was it was we might have done it over two days. I think we recorded like six songs or something for our, our demo. Um I think all originals I think it was all maybe one cover. But um but that was that was the band I was in when I met the the vehicle birth guys. We weren't they weren't we weren't called that. They were in another band, but we started we played shows together. So that's sort of how we all one of the ways we met. And so who were the guys from Vehicle Birth? So you had, um, they're all high school buddies. <clears throat> so it was uh, Lee Thompson was on uh, guitar, Jeff Galusha was on uh, drums, Tim Schmieder was a singer, and uh, Johnny Stevens was the bass player. And um, they they all knew each other, and they had started a band called Burn, and it was, um, they they weren't around for too, too long before we ran into each other, but they, um, they were hot shit, they were really good, and, um, and my band was really good too, but we were much, we weren't very, they were dangerous, we were just very good, like sort of proficient, and they were not pro at all, but they were awesome, um, super sloppy, but awesome. And um, I had, um, at that point, I'd started um, a coffee shop, which you want, I think you wanted to talk about as well. So we'd we kind of ran into each other there, and um, they wanted another guitar player, and asked me to join. You know, so that was that. And, and what do you think that you brought to the band? What were you? I don't know. Table? I mean, I think, I think the thing was is that they, they were, 
they were fantastic, and everybody knew it, and I knew it, and they knew it. Um, I'll never understand why they asked me to play with them, although I think that they – it probably depends on who you ask. I mean, I think I was I was slightly older. I kind of had my act together. Um, I could play. I think um, they – they were writing some great songs, but I think maybe they wanted, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think it was a strange, I, I, I kind of felt like the, um, in a way, like the outsider the whole time, the whole way through our career, in a way. And I think some of that is just because I came on a little bit late, but I think, um, I think I was probably the poppiest out of all of them. Like, I always wanted to write the really heavy, fast pop songs. And so I think that influence built into some of the, you know, um, Joy Division and Smiths and um, kind of more like ethereal, arty stuff that Lee and John and Jeff and Tim were after. So I think I brought in maybe a little bit of the maybe a little bit of the punk and maybe a little bit of some of the the pop structure. So together it just really worked. I mean, I think I'm just really proud of those guys and everything we did, but um yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, what what was the what was the first thing that you guys all wrote together? Well, I mean, they they probably had about five or six tunes and then I came in and immediately wrote two songs that became staples for us for a while. So, like, right off the bat, I sat down with Tim, the singer. He'd come in to the shop, and we'd sit in the back room and kind of work some things out, and he was great with lyrics, so he he was constantly writing stuff and constantly talking absolute nonsense. So he was able to sort of put together lyrics really quickly. So probably a song called Two Minutes Hate, we did, which later appeared on a compilation in Boston. Did a tune called Arms. Um, but then we just started writing like that. I mean, as soon as we came in, like I came in, we just, we were practicing more regularly. We were writing all the time. I mean, we, we wrote a lot really quickly. Like probably, you know, a song every week. Probably, I'd say. Felt like. The Zero Work Republic. Um, did did coffee play uh, a key role in that? Well, the thing the thing with the coffee shop is, you know, I I made a decision as a suburban teenager. You kind of like you kind of hit on it earlier. Like, I didn't really know a whole lot of people that were as much into music or instruments or you know things like that. So I kind of and and certainly around then there weren't any places for us to 
for kids to go and hang out. Um, certainly not places where we could congregate and not get in trouble. So as a result, I got in trouble a lot in high school or tried to avoid trouble quite a bit in high school. So part of the intention was to create a place that I could maybe meet people like me and create a sort of safe haven that was more of like a, you know, a place to listen to music, a place to write poetry, listen to poetry, maybe see some music. And coffee seemed like the way to go. I mean, my uh, my dear friend who I opened the, the coffee house with, um, you know, he and I had just taken a trip to England together and we're hitchhiking around and we're super inspired by the the pubs. You know, we obviously have bars in the, in the States, but we don't have pubs. So we don't have places where you know, people can go, families can go, kids, dogs. They hang out. Yeah, you can drink, but you can also just kind of hang out. Whereas I always thought that bars, more like you go and you get, you drink a lot and you watch sports and you're loud and that's kind of what you do. Um, so we created this place and then subsequently um, artists came there. You know, so we, I was able to meet the people that I wanted to meet and, you know, have more people, people like me in my life, you know. So coffee was the sort of the, you know, way that happens, but... Yeah, we were all pretty much jacked on caffeine constantly um, and other things. But, yeah, um, the coffee shop was uh, was a meeting place, you know, not only for us, but for a lot of people. And a lot of incredible bands came through there, kind of started there, um, became dear friends. Um, I think you've probably spoken to a few of the bands that played there over the years. But, um, yeah, it was great. Name them. The bands? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so many bands. So the, I mean, the ones that come to mind, you know, Frodis played there and the Dismemberment Plan and uh, the Sun Monkeys were, were ones that, you know, were really, really close. A band called Five State Drive. Um, and those guys are still friends. And, and lots of bands that we weren't really friends with but had their own scenes. So, you know, they would come and play and they – they had their own friends. So, you know, our circle was pretty small, um, but there were lots and lots of bands that that came through that I think um, appreciated a place where people could come. I mean, the shows were essentially free. I think they were like two or three bucks a show or something like that. And, of course, we were inspired by Fugazi and the $5 shows and all-ages shows, so we tried to replicate that model as much as we could um, at our place. I think yeah, some stories I, of us turning down some some bands that became really popular as well, and you know, I can't verify all of those stories because I I don't remember all of them, but I've heard we turned down Dave Matthews Band. I heard we turned down lots of bands that went on to be pretty big. But hey, why? Do do? Why would you have turned them down? We probably thought they sucked, man. I don't know. We 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 <laughs> we, we were we were not into college stuff. You know, we were into you know, dangerous stuff. And, you know, we would have shows that were way too many people and, you know, and in all fairness, I know close friends of mine have toured with Dave Matthews Band and say they're just absolutely fantastic guys. So nothing against those guys at all. But I think back, you know, in the early 90s, we weren't really booking acoustic acts or jam bands or anything like that. So we were, you know, it was pretty much funk bands, punk bands, rock bands, spoken word poetry so it was kind of that that was kind of just the way it was it wasn't it, we weren't really booking stuff on the lighter side of things so much well ugly played there but they could do both yeah 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 for sure and there were a lot that could and, and not that these bands that played there weren't dynamic or had softer songs but i think just as as we got loads and loads and loads of demos it was just kind of like oh, you got to draw the line somewhere in the the kids that were coming to the place seemed to really like the the heavier stuff, and we weren't really trying to attract like a jam kind of audience necessarily. So it's just I don't know, just one of the just one way it was, I guess. What was your take on on bands like back then, um, like Frodis or the Sun Monkeys? You know, what What did you think of what they were doing? Well, 
I mean, I I wanted to be in the best band in the world, and I wanted to be better than everybody. And I think all the the other guys in my band felt the same way. You know, I think we felt like when we played shows, people lost their minds, and we wrote the best songs. We crushed it every time we played. Like every time we played, it would be someone would get hurt or people couldn't get in or there'd be some sort of like we're really provocative and i think as a result super competitive so you know we we were competitive with bands from out of you know out of our little local area so we were competitive with frodus and i'm sure they were with us as well um although you know all nice people so it wasn't like an um animosity thing it was just super competitive because i think back then you know we ourselves and those other bands knew that like we were all good, you know. Frodus was great, and the, the Smeriland playing were great, and Sun Monkeys were great. So it was just kind of like the the best bands just constantly tried to up each other's, you know, up their games to try to, and everyone was sort of kept on their toes. So fortunately, we ended up playing a lot of shows with the Sun Monkeys and Dismemberment playing, so it was a lot easier to just play together than it was to to not. Um, and those friendships are still really strong today you know we don't see each other that often but you know we're for the most part you know a lot of us are still connected we know each other's wives and kids and stuff so it's pretty cool you know all these years later and, and what became of dharma is it still going on or what uh no we we had it going from we opened in i think winter of 93 and then I was there running it with with my partner Christian through maybe 94. And then I moved with the vehicle birth to Boston. Christian stayed and ran it while he finished university. And then we ended up selling it, I want to say, in 97 or 96. Because um, we just, you know, I wasn't going to go back and he didn't want to stay um, we were losing tons of money. It just wasn't a vi- We weren't running a viable business. You know, it was never, you know, never really commercially well thought out. I mean, this was sort of pre-Starbucks, and so we were, we weren't doing, as, you know, we, we couldn't give it the attention that we really needed to give it, so we, we cut our losses and, and sold the business. So it, it's a bar now, uh, same, same location. It's been a bar ever since, and, um, you know the a lot of the same sort of features are still there. You know our bar is still there and and all that stuff. But it's a like it's a bar bar now, which is ironic. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, do, truth be told, I certainly spent a, a good amount of time there. Like my uh, my older brother, who's two and a half years older, um, was a big coffee drinker and just used to go to different spots wherever to drink coffee, whether it would be, you know, Amphora or Tasty Diner or Friendly's or, you know, Bob's Big Boy or wherever it was and just Mm -hmm. sit with Mm -hmm. his buddies and and drink coffee. And so I remember he he also, he went to school in Boston. He went to Boston University during that same time that you guys were there. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. And uh, and so he would come back, you know, over the, the winters and, and summers um, when he was off from school. And so he discovered that place and, like, turned me on to it. I had started drinking coffee when I was about, like, 15. Although yeah. I never I never liked to drink coffee at night. I didn't like to drink decaf. So I remember my drink at Barma was a hot vanilla. Yeah, nice. Well, I have to I have to tell you. I mean, we we took it really seriously because when we when we opened it, we you know we we're like, look, we're gonna do coffee right. We're gonna go get locally roasted beans. We're gonna learn how to pour coffees like they do in Italy. We're gonna do everything like we're gonna do it like old school the way it's supposed to be. Because we you know all through high school we go to Denny's or the Tasty. Um, and get diner coffee, and it was great, you know, it was fine. But, you know, we, we wanted to do it right, so we, you know, we sourced, 
the equipment, we source the beans, we source everything. The milk, we got the milk brought in by a local dairy, like, every two days. I mean, everything was the the best of the best, which brought coffee aficionados over. And the one of the coolest things is some of our most loyal customers, none of the kids would ever know because they'd come during the day. So we would have old-timers come in, and they'd get, you know, macchiatos or – you know, they're double espressos and, and they just sit and have a nice cup of coffee without, you know, all the hell that would break loose after school got out. So it was pretty nice because I'd be sitting in there, you know, we'd open up the shop at six in the morning or something insane. And I'd be sitting in there with the, you know, the the old timers all day, you know, watching them enjoy the, the coffee it was great. I don't mm-hmm. think people would have cared too much in the nighttime. We could have been serving Kool-Aid. I don't think anyone would have cared. But <laughs> we, we took a lot of pride in the in the quality of the coffee and our ability to make drinks and stuff. So. My my brother and his friends cared because, you know, good, they'd, been, good. They'd, they'd been to college, you know, and they'd been living yeah. in, in a big city at that point and had well, developed we, yeah, a, a taste for, for finer coffee. I, well, we, uh, I didn't know any better. You no, know. No. I was I was freaking sixteen years old. Yeah. Well, we thought that because we were so close to George Mason University, we thought that the college kids would come and hang out and drink coffee and study, which is what I would had done in college before I dropped out to open the coffee shop. I'd go to my coffee shop and drink coffees and read and stuff. So that's sort of what we thought would happen, but it ended up being more attractive to the high school students than to the college students. Which is which is fine. It just became a completely different vibe, you know, with with kids between, you know, sixteen and eighteen versus eighteen to twenty. You know, it's pretty big difference in life. Well, stages. good for me. Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, all all of those bands that you mentioned are, you know. Just ridiculously talented, ridiculously good, and you know, it's it's crazy that that was sort of your scene. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think I can't speak for those guys, but I think we we definitely learned a lot from those bands. I mean, we learned what to do, we learned what not to do. You know, talk about a dedication to the craft. I mean, those guys in Dismemberment Plan are are so first intellectually brilliant to a man, all of them, um, but so dedicated to their craft that they were just crafting songs constantly. And so talk about being motivated. I mean, it was like, oh, my God, they've, they've just released a 7-inch and it's incredible. Or this new song they wrote is they're using a keyboard now. Oh, my God. You know, so it was just really, really hard to keep <laughs> keep up with those guys. Um, and, we, you know, we subsequently didn't. But... um but it was such a great little scene and um, super inspiring to play so many shows with with people like that. There's genuinely nice people and really good bands too. So.
let me ask you, in terms of like signing with a label, that mm-hmm. that didn't happen until you moved out of Northern Virginia? Yeah, yeah. I mean we, we found it pretty difficult to play shows um in in D C. I mean back then there was a very, very good, very strong D C scene and we couldn't we had a hard time breaking into that. Um it also sort of coincided with um with Jeff uh our drummer applying to to college and John and, and Lee and Tim as well, but Jeff wanted to go to school in Boston, and so we were kind of like, well, we either move to Boston with Jeff or we don't do the band, and we were all up for moving to Boston, so so we did. And um, enough and colleges we, up there to well, go to. Yeah, well, we all did. I mean, Jeff <laughs> Jeff went to um, to Emerson, and then the rest of us got jobs and worked. Um, we all later went to school, sort of timed it, went back to school. Tim Tim didn't go back to college, but John John and Lee did, and they're both lawyers. Um, and I did later, and and did very well in in school, much much later. But at the time, you know, we we all just got jobs, and Jeff went to school, and so we we got a practice space, we we played, and there was a, a really fantastic scene in in Boston, and a great local radio show and we'd put on the local show and we're like we're better than all these bands and so you know sort of our mission to get played on the radio our mission to make records and so we just did it ourselves and that was the dc thing as well you know we knew all these bands could do it themselves so so we gave it a go as well partially because we couldn't get signed but also partially because we knew we could do it ourselves so um our close friend robert uh, Cataldo volunteered to uh, pony up some money and put on a our second seven inch, which which he did out of our apartment, and um, and then we started getting that and our first single on the radio, and then clubs started to book us, and so then it sort of it took off pretty quickly. I think we had our first show within the first month we were there. What um, was that? What was that seven inch? What were the songs that were on it? So the one that we did ourselves before we moved was River and Level 90. It was a white 7-inch. And then Robert put out uh, one with Zero Work and Amsterdam and Limousine on it, on his uh, on his label called Lit.
And then we we brought Travis up from the Decemberman plan. We booked a bunch of studio time, and we tried to get Travis to record an EP for us. And it was we just it was a mess. We couldn't we couldn't we got we demoed kind of like eight songs or something, but they turned out terrible. So we scrapped those sessions, and then um, ended up going in a few months later and banging out the the full length. Um, which we just put out ourselves. We pressed, I don't know, like 500 copies or something, 400 copies, I don't remember. And you're talking all about the artwork. Tragedy? tragedy, yeah. Yeah, so that that was probably out in maybe 96, 95, or 90, yeah, 96, I think. And um, and we played shows off, off that, and we were we were pretty we were doing pretty well in Boston at that point. I mean, we were headlining shows in, I don't know, 200 capacity rooms, which was pretty good back then for a local band. And then um, and then we played a show, I think, out in Worcester, Massachusetts, with um, a bunch of bands, but a band called The Regrets came through, and they were signed to Crank Records from uh, Santa Monica. And um, we hit it off, and they, they really liked us, and so they went back to the label and said, hey, there's this band in Boston, and... They're great. You need to sign them, and um, and uh, they did. We we got an offer and said, "Hey, look, we'll re-release this record. We'll remaster it. You know, we'll master it for you. Put it out on CD. Put it out on vinyl. Send it all over the world." And we're like, "All right, great." <laughs> you know, it was it was great. We because we already knew that we liked it. We already you know we'd already recorded it, so it wasn't like a label was going to come in and tell us what to do. We'd already made the record, so it felt like a very safe step, you know. Felt like, okay, well, this is fine because we've already had all the creative control we needed. We made the record, and they're just going to put it out. But, you know, as you alluded to earlier, we we weren't really down with doing publicity for it. So I think that was hard for the label because for us, you know, we were we were super inspired by by bands that just didn't talk much. Slint and um, was a huge influence, and some of those, you know, Louisville bands that just they were super mysterious. You didn't know what they looked like. You didn't know who they were, you know. And that's kind of the vibe we were after. And so we didn't really do any press. Really, we played the odd radio show, but you know, we also weren't a very good interview because everything that we did had to be unanimous. Basically, so if one person didn't want to do something, we just didn't do it. Hmm. So as a result, it was pretty hard to agree on stuff to do because we each had different comfort levels with with different things. So, you know, I was always pretty comfortable with doing things to promote the music, um, and I was always happy to to talk about it, but that wasn't a shared sentiment. So I think for, for me, it was just, okay, if Jeff doesn't want to do something, we're not going to do it. Or if Tim doesn't want to do something, we're not going to do it. And it was just one of those things that we all, I think, I think I can speak for the guys, is I think we all respected that out of each other, that if something somebody didn't want to do something, then we just didn't do it. So that's we were pretty stubborn that way. Now, you said you wanted to hear your songs on the radio. Did you get it? Get that yeah, experience? Yeah. I mean, what yeah. what what song um, were they spinning off of Tragedy? Um, well, we they played all of our singles on the local radio shows when we before we put out Tragedy. So that was a that was cool. We'd all huddle around the the stereo in our apartment when we all lived together and you know the first time we heard our single on there it was awesome so every sunday we'd sit and we wait for them to play our song so every sunday almost every sunday we'd hear ourselves which is great um but when tragedy came out they what, what was tended... the first what was the first one you heard well the first one was river the first was our first single the first song we ever put out was the first thing that that they played on the radio so i was like oh this is how it's done you just make a song, you put it on a record, and you make sure you're better than everybody else, and it gets played on the radio. Easy. So that's <laughs> kind of what we did. And then and then it happened every time we did a single. And then when Tragedy came out, they liked the um, 
I mean, they like the popular songs, you know, so we'd hear songs like Marathon on the radio. Um, oh, they really liked that song, We Need to Find the Girls. So that was, that was played quite a bit. Um, but those two got played a lot. We Need to Find the Girls and Marathon got played a lot. And then Leaders of Pursuit was another well, one that got played quite a bit. Well, Mar- Marathon has the riff, you know, yeah. and, and, and We Need to Find the Girls has the hook. So it's like yeah. that, that one has, a, you know, the vocal hook to it, and it feels like Marathon has that kind of riff that you were talking about, that you, you know, that, that you like to play. Yeah, well, Marathon, you know, it was in in Boston, you know, Marathon Monday is always a big thing, you know, and, and back in whatever year it was, 95, Lee, or the guitar player, he and I, we're off of work and we're hanging out downtown and we were get day drinking and watching the, the marathon and, you know, we were just talking about just hanging out and in the middle of the day, a little, a little buzzed and, and I said, look, dude, I, I got this really, I got this riff. It's really heavy and it kind of goes like this, but I don't really have a, I don't, I don't know where it goes. I had, I had the beginning riff and I had, I had the break. And Lee's like, well, I've got this, I got a couple things. I got this kind of ascending chorus thing. I guess it could be, so let, you know, why don't we go to the space and, and play? So then we just walked down to the, our practice space. I played him my half. He played me his half. And that, then we wrote Marathon. That's, we pretty much just put two completely different songs together. And it was great. And then we had, we had, had to get the guys to come down and get Tim to make up lyrics. And it was Marathon Day. He's like, all right, well, I'll sing about a <laughs> marathon, and that's how what you know, that's how it came together. I think it came together in like a day. The best ones always do. Yeah, so that was that was a quick one, and that was that was fun. But I mean, as we as we kind of kept writing songs, it was pretty clear that I I tended to write the heavy, fast ones, and then you know Tim started writing really slow ones, and Jeff liked really slow ones, and and Lee was taking guitar lessons from Roger Miller at that point from Mission of Burma, so he was practicing a lot of really bizarre chord progressions and 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 experimenting with effects. So we just started to go kind of all over the place, um, which made the songwriting really interesting because like our sets would be, okay, super fast, heavy ones and really loud and then really slow, really quiet ones. And I don't think people really knew what what to expect when, when we played, which I think was, was kind of cool, but it was also probably pretty schizophrenic for people to be like, are they a rock band? Are they an art band? Are they what is he doing, you know, because it wasn't like the Vehicle Birth song didn't really, you couldn't really describe it because they they're so different. All the songs are so different from each other. 
Well, and and bands like I guess like Pavement, you know, and and Guided by Voices, bands like that hadn't really gotten, you know, big yet. So people were not used to to seeing that or hearing that before. Yeah, I don't. I mean, we we were listening to bands like. Sebado and Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine and the Velvet Underground and so for us it's, it didn't seem altogether that different from those bands you know and and I was getting into bands like Rocket from the Crypt and Drive Like Jehu and so I was really interested in playing like heavy power chords and just writing one note and you know Lee was getting really into you know Jeff was getting into like Miles Davis and so, so free jazz and acid jazz and John was into a lot of funk. So, you know, it was, we were kind of all over the place, and none of the stuff sounded that different from that stuff when you really sort of put them together. It's like, oh, that sounds kind of like something off a of Pitches Brew, or that, that break sounds exactly like the chorus from, you know, that one Fugazi song. But I guess when you sort of put it all together, people were yelling at us like, you know, Joy Division! And they weren't really making the connection to, you know, the pavement record that was out or the super chunk record that was out or, you know, cause there were, there were bands that were kind of doing similar, similar things, but you're right. I mean, they were all kind of new and they certainly weren't that popular back then. Right. It's like now we sort of, almost, there's almost like a genre for that, you know, yeah. there's almost like a genre yeah. of the genre list. Yeah. So we, you know, we were, and, we were and playing hey, with, at that time, that stuff could find its way onto the radio. Good luck trying to do that now. Yeah, I mean, listen, we were great, but, at, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of bands were, were getting signed and a lot of bands were getting played on the radio. So it was a completely different... You just sort of had to be good to get a record out and played. You know, you didn't need a brand, you didn't need a merch line, you didn't need to really tour either. So... It was definitely a different time, and there were fantastic bands that were able to get played that never got their due, you know, from from back then. Just really fantastic bands that were just simply good that never really played out that much. Um, but you're right. From I that mean, Boston just, scene? Oh, sure, but from all over the place. I mean, we'd go to local, you know, we'd tour and we'd go to local towns, and they, and there'd be... You know, there'd be great bands, you know, every other night there'd be, oh man, these guys are actually really good, you know. And then of course over the years some of them turn into, you know, incredible bands and some of them you never hear from again. But, you know, we were playing with bands like Sweet the Leg Johnny from Chicago who are fantastic, Shiner from Kansas City, I guess, and, you know, just bands that were just really, really, really good and, and, never got the recognition that they deserve. So, you know, just... But I guess that's probably true now, too, I suppose. Yeah, and it's it's very true of, you know, the Northern Virginia band. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know... Um, I mean, I'm really happy that the plan did so well. Those guys are great, but... Yeah, I mean, so many bands... You know, so many kids. I mean, th that's part of it. I mean, those suburbs are so huge. That suburb is so huge. Northern Virginia is just enormous. And so you've got tens of thousands of teenagers playing, you know, playing music. And, and I don't know of many other suburbs that are quite quite that big. I mean, maybe the suburbs of maybe Chicago and, and L.A. maybe. But, I mean, Northern Virginia is massive. So, yeah, a lot of. A lot of bands, a lot of musicians. Dave yeah, Gold, well, it, you know, it, it is it is good that the dismemberment plan kind of got got out of, got out and got heard of those bands because I <clears throat> I love them and love what what they did also. Well, they put in the work. I mean, they're very good musicians, but they put in the work. They put in a lot of work, and those guys they grew up together. I mean, they, they, they were, we were kids when we were all hanging out and, you know, they, they played together for a long, long, long time and they, they worked, you know, they, they made it their job, which is something that, you know, we weren't willing or weren't able 
to do all at the same time. I mean, I think I was certainly up for it. I think probably at certain different times, some of the guys in the bands may have been up for it, maybe not. I mean, there were things going on that, you know, were were difficult for some of the guys, you know, that they were working through. So I think, you know, we just couldn't, we just couldn't hack it. But bands like The Plan, you know, they, they made it their job to make music and they did. So they totally deserved it. You know, it wasn't just luck for them. They made it their job. They had really strong allies in the Jawbox guys and, and the Smart One Crazies and, and, and even the Discord guys, you know, very supportive and, and they deserve it. So, so what wound up happening with the vehicle birth? Um, well, I, I love those guys. And I spent a lot of my life with them, and I have a lot of really positive, happy memories. I'm super proud of the music we made. But we never really all got along together at the same time. So, you know, there might be a time when I was getting along with all but one guy, and then there would be a portion of time when he might have been the only guy I got along with. But we were never really all consistently, I think, happy together. We knew we were great. We knew that we had a lot of potential, but we just didn't see eye to eye on everything, you know, on the things that I think you need to, certainly on, on, you know, being on time or being a dedicated, you know, dedicated practicing time, doing what we needed to do to make music. You know, I think there wasn't really the respect for sort of personal boundaries or personal interests. It was kind of like, no, this is the way the vehicle birth does things. So there wasn't a whole lot of room for, I think, independence. And I think we were hard to be around. I think the guys probably each, we each found each other difficult to be around at times. So we were on tour, um, and it was a U.S. tour. It was going to be for over a month. And, you know, a, a quarter of the way in, it was, becoming increasingly clear to me that we we probably weren't very good on the road together. I mean, we just, just didn't get along. And some of the guys would be late, like late for the sets or skipping sound checks or you know, just kind of crappy stuff. And so I I said something with another guy saying to the group, you know, I think we should probably – not tour after this. I think we should probably stay in Boston and make records. I think that's probably a better use of our time. I think we'd probably be able to accomplish a lot more. I think we'd all be a lot happier. And um, and one of the guys was really offended and said, no, if we're not going to tour, then I'm not going to be in the band. And, and that was kind of set the tone. And so we sort of limped through half of the tour, barely speaking, and then by the time we got to, um, I believe it was Seattle, I think it was Portland, um, we just said, look, this, tonight's going to be the last show. Let's just play the show and then go home. And we played the show, and then we drove straight home <laughs> from yeah. arguably the furthest point away um, from Boston that we that that there was, and drove home. It took, I don't know, it took us like two days, barely speaking, and, and that was it. And then we, you know, we didn't play again for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that, 13 years or something after that. So I don't want to, I don't want to name names. I don't want to put people. Oh, you know, no, no, no. But, but, I mean, but that's look. kind of the thing, you know, it was ultimately like one person said that he didn't want to play if we wouldn't tour and that was it. But that's kind of the spirit of the band. It's like, if it's not unanimous, then we're not going to do it. He's like, right. you know, F and, you, and like F you, you guys. Said. You know. If you guys aren't getting along and you guys aren't seeing eye to eye about about everything, and everything has to be unanimous, it's really hard to you know to move forward that way. Yeah, and it was a it was a bummer because back then you know you could you could just sit in a studio and make records and not tour, and there were bands that were doing that like you know Tortoise and Rachel's and these fantastic bands. They, I mean, they would play shows from time to time, but. Like they were able to actually like make a lot of music, and you had those guys 
in right. multiple bands, making lots and of you incredible have, music. You could have played in in and around Boston and New yeah. York, yeah, yeah. and you yeah. know, yeah. and maybe Philly, and you know. Yeah. There's no, yeah. like, you don't have to go on tour around the U.S. Right. or around Europe, like, that you certainly right. can, can play shows. Yeah, and that was the, and that was at least my thinking. It was, okay, let's just go home to our own homes. Like, at that point, I was living, um, like, we all weren't living together. Some of the guys were living together, but we'd all sort of had our own places and our own, our own lives. So I was like, look, we can go home, we can do our own thing, we can make music, and it'll be great. And then when we've had enough of each other, we can go home and, you know, pick it up another day. So I think that was that was kind of my my hope, and I think some of the other guys' hope as well. But um, but I think, so, you know, there was a sense of betrayal that was like, oh, well, if you don't want to play, then we're not going to play. So I think that's kind of how that was taken which is too bad. What have you been doing uh, musically since? Well, um, I had been in another band at that point as well. So I was doing, I had found an outlet for my heavy rock stuff. So I had been in a, a, a heavy rock band called Crack Torch, um, which was a bit of a, not a super group, but, you know, other people in other bands that just like to hang out and we formed that band. So that ended up going on for about 10 years. And uh, we got signed and, and we did tours and played with some amazing bands. Um, but then I had sort of made a deal with myself that if by the time I hit 30, I didn't have the, the kind of life that I wanted, whatever that life was when I hit 30, that I'd reevaluate my choice of career and I'd, I'd go back to school and finish my degree, which I'd abandoned to open the, the Dharma Coffee House. So that's what I did. So the band, we never really officially broke up, but we don't really play anymore. Um, but maybe, maybe now that I'm back in the country and we're all, you know, still somewhat spry, maybe we'll start playing some more. <laughs> everything, uh, particularly your time, you know, playing music in, in Northern Virginia. Like, how, how do you feel about that and about, you know, sort of what you accomplished sonically? Oh, man. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I kind of feel like at this point, you know, I'm, I'm not, certainly not old, but I'm, I'm what, 45 now. So sometimes I feel like I could have recorded and made so much more music than I did. <laughs> um, but I, I think, I think a lot of people probably feel that way. But, you know, when I think back to those times, I don't really have any, um, I don't have any regrets. I just think that it's pretty, I think I'm just pretty lucky to have been able to say, you know, this is a place that has a lot of talented people. I just don't know where to find them. And then to be inspired by the older generation in D.C., you know, the Ian McKay's and, and the people who were making things happen on their own, to be inspired to open a place for the artists to come, to then find them, to then make a band with them, to then make music with them. I think that's just, um, 
I don't know if that really happens as often in other parts of the country, but I think that's a really special part of Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia, at least for me, is being inspired by that do-it-yourself attitude and to be able to see the results of that, like the the um, the validation to be like, look, you know, if you see a need, don't wait for someone to make it happen. If you make it happen, and so now, you know, sitting in, you know, my living room, I can look back and be like, yeah, you know, we made it happen. We made music. We had a scene. You know, I'm thinking back fondly about the songs and shows that I saw and the experiences that my friends then went on to have, you know, opening for massive bands and, you know, having just these fantastic experiences. It's just, you know, even though Vehicle Birth faded out way before I think we probably could have, um, um, I think back on it very fondly. You know, it's it's a really great place, I think, to have. I mean, it was crappy living there, but it does hold a little place in my heart, you know. Mm-hmm. 